Howdy, friends. So, it's no secret that over the years I have read many, 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 many awful books. And, yeah, that uh, seems to be what people who watch my channel are much more interested in than anything. Like, people keep going, James, why don't you talk more about books you like? I do. I, I do it semi-frequently. You people just don't watch. Maybe you should check your subscription feed once in a while instead of just demanding YouTube spoon feed everything to you, but, you know, that's just me. That's just what I'm thinking. But anyways, even the worst books that I read usually have something enjoyable in them. And I think you'll find that throughout my videos I am pretty fair with these things. Like when a terrible book that I don't like does something well, I will usually point out, yeah, it did that thing well. And sometimes it's just one good character that I was into. Sometimes there's a couple of jokes spread throughout that gave me a chuckle. Sometimes there's parts of the setting that are kind of cool. But the thing is, those are usually stuff that's one good aspect, but it's spread throughout the whole series. And sometimes there's literally just one great scene or one great sequence in the book, and outside of that, it's terrible. It's like you're sailing an ocean of crap and you find this island where you can be safe for just a little while, but then the tides start rising. I think most of you understand the concept of top 10 lists by now, so yeah, here we go. This is it. This is the top 10 great scenes in otherwise terrible books, and there will be spoilers ahead, which seems pretty obvious to me, but people complain if you don't say that, so spoilers ahead. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So starting off the list at number 10, we have the plane crash scene from Glass Sword, which is the second Red Queen book. Now, I have said too much about Red Queen at this stage. Like, <laughs> I have almost three hours of footage in total of me talking about that series for some reason, and it's not very good. You know, it, it has opportunities to do a lot of interesting cool stuff spread throughout all four books, but it never does anything with them. So the whole thing just winds up being mediocre. Like, it's not even funny bad for the most part, it's just mediocre and dull and kind of stupid. However, there are some kind of fun action scenes in there, and one of them is the plane crash from the end of the second book, because in that world, if you didn't know, there are people who have crazy magic powers, and some of them, called magnetrons, can actually control metal, kind of like Magneto from the X-Men. And uh, in, near the end of the second book, the main characters who are in open rebellion against their government by this stage are flying in a jet, and somehow some magnetrons know where they are, so they grab them, they grab their jet, and pull it out of the sky. So they are falling, crashing, while the jet is being crushed around them, and then they finally crash to the ground, which is amazing just in terms of visuals, but then when they crash, they're surrounded, and main character girl has to give herself up uh, as a prisoner to the bad guys so that her friends can be let go and they can escape and hopefully live to fight another day. And in a book series where there are very few points where the main characters are actually at any sort of low point, you know, they, they very rarely are actually suffering, and it very rarely looks like they're in really serious trouble. It is nice to have one book that ends on an actual cliffhanger where the characters had something bad happen and they lost a battle, and now they're in serious trouble. And, again, like, that doesn't really lead into anything great in the next book or anything, but it is nice to have at least a bit of a cliffhanger, and the scene itself was just cool to visualize. Number nine is going to be Fleeing from the Wild Nanites, which is in Meridian, which is the second book in the Arclight series. Now, Arclight is not super well known. Like, it's not what I would call obscure, but I did review it last year, and I don't think a whole lot of other people have read these books, or at least they haven't read past the first one, because the first one has an interesting premise. It's uh, after the apocalypse, these people live in this, uh, you know, settlement, enclave, whatever you want to call it, and they are constantly surrounded by these creatures called Fades. And at first, Fades seem like they're some sort of supernatural creature because they are killed by light. Not, not even just sunlight, just light in general kills them. Uh, but we learn pretty quickly that they're actually humans that are possessed by nanites, like nanomachines that just got out of control. And the first book is really boring because there's just no conflict. And then the second book, the first half of it also has no conflict, and then, finally, we are introduced to the concept of wild nanites, because while the fades turn out to be pretty friendly overall, 
The wild nanites are nanomachines that haven't possessed anything. They just share one massive hive mind and their only goal is to consume everything in their path and propagate themselves. And once the heroes finally learn that and they finally go out to try and deal with the wild nanites, they get trapped and they see there are uncountable numbers of these things. Like they see a swarm of them. It just looks like a big black cloud. It is miles wide and thousands of feet tall. Like it's just a gigantic storm of these things coming towards them and they have to run away and they get into, you know, buildings that they're running through while the nanites are creeping through cracks trying to get at them and they can, they have some lights, they have Molotov cocktails and stuff, but they can't uh, last until daytime. So they have to, you know, get out of the area as fast as they can. It's a really, really thrilling sequence. And un unfortunately it wasn't thrilling enough to make me actually finish the series. Like I just straight up never read the final Arclight book <laughs> and I don't think I ever will, but just this one sequence is great because like for once yes the heroes lives are in danger and they have to like actually go out and work to survive instead of just realizing oh okay that this was a misunderstanding and everyone is fine now and the book just keeps going even though there's no conflict you know like for once there is something cool happening and this whole sequence i i don't have a whole lot to say about it specifically it's just really neat like the nanites are not only coming as a amorphous swarm but they are like forming shapes of animals and stuff to come after them it's just, it's cool you know like the visuals of it are cool it's nice to finally get some action and finally get something interesting happening after all of that and i don't have a whole lot else to say like meridian's a bad book arc light is a bad book series but the 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 final sequence with the wild nanites was cool number eight is meeting the cathay from the wise man Wise Man's Fear, aka the second King Killer Chronicles book. Now, it's no secret that I don't like the Wise Man's Fear. It's it's really bad, and it's like just the whole thing is a journey of a man who feels like how neckbeards see themselves, and it's just, it's just not good. Okay, like that. There's very little that's actually advancing the story that happens in it. Uh, the Name of the Wind wasn't a perfect book, but it was enjoyable enough and the sequel going downhill this far is a massive disappointment. But there is a whole sequence where Kvoth, the main character, gets sucked into the fairy world and spends like a hundred pages learning how to have sex from a fairy, which, God, that, that is stupid. But also while he's in the fairy world, he runs into this creature called the Cathay. Now the Cathay is a little difficult to explain. Like, it's a demon which long ago was sealed within a tree because presumably they, they couldn't think of a way to kill it. And the Cathay can see the future. Like, it can see every possible future that, because uh, the future changes depending on what decisions people make, and it can see into every possible future, and it just wants to cause as much chaos and destruction as possible. So anyone who runs into the Cathay, it will talk to them, and it knows exactly how they will respond to anything that it says, so it's going to say something to them that will cause the maximum amount of destruction. And so from that, it's implied that uh, because in the future, uh, while Kvothe is telling this story, he it seems to be all destroyed and there's a lot of chaos and everything, and it, so it seems like whatever the Cathay told him will indirectly lead to him doing something horrible and causing the whole world to get all fucked up, which is the only reason why I'm still kind of interested in reading the third King Killer book whenever the fuck that finally comes out. It's been almost 13 years now. <laughs> Jesus. But meeting the Cathay is like this diamond in the pile of shit that is the wise man's fear, you know? Because th this one scene is horrifying and fascinating in equal measures, and you're just wondering, well, okay, how did this happen? Why did it happen? Because the, the Cathay is guarded. You're not supposed to be able to just run into it, but somehow Kvoth did. And you're also wondering exactly what uh, will it will cause Kvoth to do and how it will happen. Like, th there's so many questions that it uh, brings up, and I am interested in learning all of them. So, yeah, it's just one really, really great scene in an otherwise terrible book. Then coming in the list at number seven is going to be The Battle of Golden Gate Bridge from End of Days, which is the third and final book in the Angel Fall series. Well, okay, it's not actually called Angel Fall. It's called Penryn and the End of Days, but there are a lot of book series that, for whatever reason, 
their actual title is not what they're known by popularly. So whatever. <laughs> it's the third Angel Fall book. We'll just go with that. And there, this is a series that has a really good setup. And I think the first book is fantastic, but then it goes downhill and the third one is really terrible because like angels appear one day and they just start killing humanity. Like they just destroy most of the world right away. And then they start massacring all of the survivors. And the main character is trying to survive in this post-apocalyptic landscape. And a lot of the story takes place in the San Francisco area, which, if you were unaware, is on a peninsula. And in the last book, uh, the angels are arguing over who gets to be in charge because their leader was actually killed right at the beginning of the invasion. And so some of them, to show off uh, how powerful they are, they decide to have a hunt where they will just see who can kill the most humans in that area. So they set a giant fire to cut off everyone on the peninsula from escaping to the mainland, and then they just start working their way in. And so Penryn and a couple of other survivors just say, okay, we need to get some of the women and children and other people who can't fight away on boats, but in order to do that, we just need to cause a distraction. So basically her and a bunch of others set up at Golden Gate Bridge, make themselves a nice target, and they realize like, we're probably going to die, but we're going to make, but we're gonna buy time for others. But then the battle is incredible because it's nighttime and angels have really sensitive uh, sight and hearing. So the humans set up a bunch of like loudspeakers that'll blare music really loudly. And they have lights that'll shine in the angels eyes that will like blind them. And the humans are still able to fight like that. And then like some friendly angels show up who can fight with them. And so they'll like have the music blaring and the lights on and the humans will fight the bad angels while that's happening. Uh, but then the bad angels will start to adjust and realize what's going on uh, and be able to fight a little better. So they'll shut it off, but then the humans won't be able to fight that well. So the, hu the friendly angels will fight them. And it's a, like just going back and forth. And so it's keeping the enemy off balance. It's like a really, really good plan. It's really entertaining. I didn't see it coming. And the only reason it's not higher on the list is because it looks like the heroes are about to win just through ingenuity and cleverness and you know being really, really determined in the face of an overwhelming force. Uh, but then like Satan shows up and like the day is about to be ruined, but it turns out one of the friendly angels made a deal with Satan to, you know, save the day. It's just, I don't know, it, it didn't quite work that way. And if it hadn't been for that, this would have been higher on the list. But as it is, it's still a really great scene in an otherwise terrible book. Number six is going to be Hunting the Leviathan from Leviathan by R.M. Huffman. Now, boy, I this book is boring. It's just really boring. Like, it's literally just trying to tell the story of Noah, like, from the Bible. Uh, but it's when he's a young man and it's before the flood, so he's in a world where there are still, like, Nephilim running around and stuff. And even if that sounds kind of cool... Don't worry, R.M. Huffman somehow manages to make it really boring because he's literally just some weirdo Christian who takes the Bible literally and thinks humans and dinosaurs lived side by side. But that's not really the point here, okay? The book starts off with a Leviathan attacking Noah's village and where he lives, and a Leviathan is like this big dragon thing that breathes fire. And no one's ever killed one before, so he just goes off to get help. He manages to get some friends to come and help him. And then they, like, set up a bunch of traps for the Leviathan, and it comes in, and they fight it, and there's a big battle. The battle is kind of fun. It very much is the highlight of the book. And, I, again, just like Angel Fall, I would put it higher on the list if it weren't for the way it ends being really stupid. Because, you see, Noah realizes partway through that uh, the Leviathan is able to breathe fire because it has two different chambers in its head with different chemicals, and then it spits them out, and when they mix, they form fire. And so Noah's like, okay, how can we get them to mix together? And his brilliant plan is to just have one of his friends, like he doesn't even do it himself, he just tells one of his friends, break its skull open with an axe. And then his friend does that, and it explodes in a fireball, and everyone is like super impressed with Noah's brilliant strategy. <laughs> like, it, it's stupid, but... You know, like, if they hadn't treated it like it was a brilliant plan, brilliant strategy, then I think it still would have been cool. But as it is, it's just like a fun fight, which then goes downhill and doesn't quite work at the end. But don't have a lot else to say beyond that. Like, it's just, you know, a, a people fighting a dragon. That's cool. Number five is The Eruption from Supervolcano Eruption. 
I normally like Harry Turtledove. He has some good stuff. His alternate history work is fantastic for the most part, but Super Volcano Eruption is... Uh, what, what was he doing <laughs> with that? Because the, the whole conceit of the series is that the super volcano underneath Yellowstone National Park erupts and humanity has to deal with the devastation that comes from that. That is a good idea for a story, but then it really just focuses on this one family and them all being terrible to each other and all of the issues that they have, like, even after the volcano goes off. It's, it's just not a good book. It's just not. But the actual scene where the eruption happens is phenomenal, okay? Because it takes about 100 pages before it happens, and there's a lot of buildup in that time where characters are explaining what would happen if the uh, volcano goes off and what's going on and everything, and then the characters are, like, at Yellowstone National Park, and they're like, this is about to blow. We need to get the fuck out of here now. And then they get in a helicopter, fly as far away as they can, a couple hundred miles. And they're like, hey, it's, it's going to go off. So we need to get down and they like, get on the ground and uh, plug their ears and everything. And then this massive, unfathomably huge shockwave goes out. And it, you see it from a couple different people's perspectives spread throughout the entire country. And there's like earthquakes several states away. Uh, and the shockwave causes one guy who's in a plane, it causes his plane to uh, fall out of the sky, and they nearly crash and die. It, like, it's just an incredible sequence, and it makes you really wonder, like, yeah, like, it feels like the world is ending. What happens next? How are they going to deal with this? And unfortunately, the rest of the book doesn't do a great job with that. But like, that one sequence where you, you are just feeling the scale and the size and the weight of this uh, volcano and it's and uh, the way it's going off and you're, you're just feeling like the world is ending it's phenomenal it really is it i again i wish that the rest of the book lived up to it but hey we got that one scene that's something number four is anna getting her soul back in winter war awakening which is the third book of blood rose rebellion now i don't talk about blood rose rebellion all that much because i think i've said all there is to possibly say about it but it is a pretty bad book series. You know, like, the world building of it is genuinely the worst I think I've ever seen. M maybe there's one or two worse than that. I would need to stop and think about it for a while. But, like, it it's just stupid, okay? It's just 19th century Europe. Some people have magic. Also, there's some magical creatures running around. But also, all the countries and everything are exactly the same. It's, it's, it's kind of dumb. But then we have our main character girl, whose name is Anna Arden. And she, for whatever reason, just breaks magic whenever she's nearby like she can't really control it she tries but she just can't and we learn partway through the series that that's because she actually has two souls inside her body she's what's known as a chimera and so uh because her souls are like not in resonance they're like rubbing up against each other it makes it almost impossible for her to do magic but it also makes it so that she can break other people's magic which sounds kind of op to begin with and i would have liked to read a series just about someone that can do that but then also she can learn to force her two souls to work together so she can do magic twice as good as everyone else. So she just winds up being kind of like a, oh, okay, main character has all these crazy powers just handed to them. Anna is also just kind of an obnoxious character. Like, she's a jerk to a lot of people. Her actions or inactions cause a lot of other people to get hurt and face horrible consequences. Like, she's not a good person for the most part. But then, during the final battle of book three, she learns that her evil uncle is planning on uh, taking one of her souls and then somehow implanting it into himself. And she's not going to die from this, because again, she has two. But he's going to do that, and then he's going to go back in time and make himself emperor. It, like, that's basically his evil plan. He's the final villain of the series. And she, she does succeed in stealing her soul, or one of her souls, temporarily. Uh, but right after that happens, she's like, has a brief moment where she's like, oh my god, I've lost, what can I do? And she's like, wait, no, I, I still have one soul, I can still do magic and stuff, Let, let's go. And then she goes off, and she stabs her uncle, and she says, I will be having my soul back now, and she takes it back from him. And, well, I, I think that's about it, but, you know, I, I think... Part of the reason that I like this moment so much is because Anna had just been such an unlikable character up until this point. Like, she was, again, annoying, she was a jerk, she was just kind of good at things because the story demanded she be good at things. 
But she does have this one really, really cool moment, and if, if she had been a more likable character before that, I don't think I would be as hyped for this, and I don't think I would have liked this as much, but hey, you know what? I'm not going to complain. A Anna Arden got one really cool, one really badass moment near the end of the series, and so that, that makes this one great scene in an otherwise terrible book, which was preceded by two other terrible books. Number three is just going to be every scene from the Tim Worth Chronicles Dream State. Now, <laughs> I know that might sound strange. Like, how is every scene great if the book is terrible? And I mean that I, I don't even really know quite how to explain it. The Tim Worth Chronicles is an absolutely insane book, and it's terrible, but it's amazingly terrible. Like, it's hilarious at every step of the way. Like, a lot of stuff that is, like, funny bad, whether we're talking books, movies, video games, whatever, a lot of it, you really only have a couple of really funny moments and the rest is boring. And I can see why people wouldn't be into, like, you know, hilariously bad movies and stuff because of that. But the Tim Worth Chronicles, almost every scene is hilarious and stupid and bad. I don't even know where to begin explaining this. Like, it's literally just a guy gets bullied one day and then decides to commit suicide, but then he gets brought back to life by a mysterious figure with spider hands. And then when he gets brought back to life, he has the powers of God. <laughs> and then some people uh, um, start kidnapping his family to try and gain the powers of God for themselves, and they like cut off his mom's ear and start frying it on the stove. And then he finds out that actually aliens invaded Earth a while ago and put humans into this giant Matrix-esque computer program, and that's why he has these crazy powers. And I just, it's a really, really, really stupid book, but every scene is amazing. <laughs> That's all. That's all I can say. The Tim Worth Chronicles Dream State is very stupid, but I loved it. Then the number two spot is going to be The Beginning of Wanderers by Chuck Wendig. Now, this book I didn't even finish, which is rare for me, but this one was really long. I was just, I, I was just done with it by around the two-thirds mark, especially once we find out exactly what's going on, because it was a stupid explanation. But it starts off with a whole bunch of people entering this sort of hypnotic state and just massing together and then walking like they don't know exactly where they're walking it's just west somewhere and so people are following them and they're filming them and they become like a sensation on the internet and the news and everything and they don't know exactly what's happening but also these people are being protected from something or protected by something because uh doctors try to like draw blood from them somehow to see what's affecting them because it seems like some sort of illness and they can't do it a storm comes along and they don't get hit by anything. It's like, it's a fascinating opening and a fascinating setup for a story. It just becomes stupid after a while. Like, uh, we find out that there was a machine that could see the future or something. It sent itself back in time and created nano machines to cause all these people to bunch up like that and start walking so that they could create a new civilization after this one dies because there's some sort of fungus disease going around. Look, it does not make sense. It just straight up does not make sense, which is why this book is so bad. But the opening is great. Before we get to the number one spot, let's go over a couple of honorable mentions real quick. Uh, so honorable mention number one is going to be when Lucifer appears in Passion, which is the third book of the Fallen series. Now, Fallen is not a good book series, but it's weird because it kept making me think that it would get good later. <laughs> like, I kept, it kept bringing up ideas that I thought would be explored in some way, and I was excited to see where it went, but then it just wasn't exploring them, and then it would bring up some new possible ideas, and then it just, and then it ended, and that, that was it. But at the end of book three, we did get a moment where the main character has been traveling back in time with a character named Bill for that entire book, and then she learns Bill has been Lucifer all along. It wasn't exactly a great twist that was hard to see coming, but it was still a well-done moment. And then Lucifer tells her, oh yeah, this was all part of my plan, by the way. And then he like kicks her back to the present day. And then they realize they only have a couple of days to stop Lucifer before he destroys the world. It's like time travel nonsense, which is stupid. But again, like it ends on like an actual cliffhanger and I wanted to see what happened next so it was like it, it was injecting some much needed tension into an otherwise terrible series and it doesn't do a great job with it but hey we we got that one moment 
Then there was the battle against the Brotherhood Slave Plantation in The Last Full Measure, which is the third book of the Divided We Fall series. Now, I just talked about Divided We Fall for over an hour. It's terrible. There's a lot of reasons why it's terrible. Leave me alone. But in the third book, the main character guy finally realizes that, yes, the people I've been working with this whole time are a bunch of evil neo-Nazis, and at first he just runs away, but then he finds this camp where they are, it's a slave plantation, basically. They are using men as forced labor and women as sex slaves. And he's like, okay, well, we need to fight against that. And so he and his friends do fight against them and free them. And it's, it's a fun battle scene. It's not the best ever, which is part of why it's not on this list. And it, it seems like for once, yes, finally, the main character is moving beyond being such an awful human being, and he's finally realizing, okay, I worked with some bad people before and I helped them run wild, but now I'm gonna help put a stop to them. And again, during the camp battle, they kill a bunch of neo-Nazis, which is always good and kind of satisfying, but then after that, the story doesn't really do anything else with that. Like, there's not, the story goes on for a while after that, and then there's no real climax, and then it ends, and the bad guys honestly get most of what they want. So it's just, I don't know, it's a, it's not great, it's not good enough to wind up on this list, but it did give me hope momentarily. And then there's all of Gavin's flashbacks from Blood Mirror, which is the fourth book in the Lightbringer series. Now, I'm not gonna get into all of the backstory that led up to this in the Lightbringer series, because they are five increasingly long books, and they increasingly bring up more weird, stupid information, and they increasingly just bring up more dumb plot points and plot threads that don't... It, look, the, the Lightbringer books start off good and then they get really stupid, okay? But uh, the thing is, Gavin, the protagonist, or at least I think he's supposed to be the protagonist of the books, his past has a lot of holes in it. Like, he doesn't remember a lot of his own past. He doesn't remember a lot of things that have happened. Like, he doesn't even remember killing his own brother. Uh, but in the fourth book, Blood Mirror, we do finally get some flashbacks where we learn about his powers and we learn about Black Luxin, which is basically just anti-magic. It's kind of like anti-magic in that world. Again, don't know how to explain it without being here for way too long. Uh, and again, we learn about him killing his brother and stuff. Like, all the flashbacks in that book are great. They're a relatively small part of the book, though. <laughs> and, uh, like, again, the fact that I can only remember broad strokes of it, and I don't remember a lot of specific moments, I think that should tell you exactly why it's an honorable mention and it didn't really warrant being on the list. But then finally, the number one best great scene in an otherwise bad book is The Battle of O'Rourke's Drift from On the Oceans of Eternity, which is the third book in the Island in the Series, Island in the Sea of Time series, or Nantucket series. I, again, I've seen it be called both, but Whatever, the point is, On the Oceans of Eternity doesn't really have a beginning, you know, it like, because it kind of just leads straight from the second book into the third, and the structure of it isn't great, but at least it got things going quickly. Uh, but then it also doesn't have much of an ending. Like, I think I put this on my top 10 worst endings list for a reason. They kind of defeat the bad guy, but then other bad guys go off to continue doing bad guy things and, like, just... The story's still interesting, but then it just, it just ends and we're not left with a satisfying conclusion, which is unfortunate. But you might also remember that on my top 10 best action scenes list, I put the Battle of O'Rourke's Drift, and that's because, yeah, it's incredible. You have a small number of soldiers with semi-modern weapons, like they're, they're single-shot uh, bolt-action rifles, so not exactly modern warfare, but they have that, and they're fighting a gigantic horde of barbarians, who some of whom have like muskets and blunderbusses, but nothing more advanced than that, and a lot of them just have axes and swords and bows and arrows. And so the heroes have a defensive position, and they just need to hold it while they're being swarmed by tens of thousands of barbarian warriors. And the thing that really makes the enemy scary here is that they will not break no matter how many of their comrades die, because the heroes actually dig these massive ditches in front of their position so that uh, as the other guys are charging up and trying to get at them, they can't just run right at them if they get close. But the ditches literally fill up with dead bodies 
and the other guys like are able to just walk across their friends and keep coming. And it's an incredible moment and the the um the imagery there is horrifying but also like you're just kind of impressed <laughs> with the bad guys here because they are really not giving up at any uh they're not giving up no matter what. So I did fantastic it was I loved that. It was fantastic. I'm having trouble talking about this. And similarly the heroes just they have no choice. Again, they're they're surrounded. They need to hold this line no matter what. So they keep taking heavy, heavy casualties and they're falling back further and further and further, but they just can't be willing to give up. So they they keep uh, shooting. Once they run out of ammo, they affix bayonets and fight hand to hand. Like it, it's an incredible, incredible sequence. And it's in a really bad kind of forgettable book. Well, maybe not forgettable, but it is a pretty bad book, that, which was a bad ending to a series that started off really strong. And uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. So all the people watching this, uh, what do you think of when you think of a great scene in an otherwise really bad book or otherwise really bad book series? Like, let, let me know down below. And again, I'm talking about like one specific scene or one specific sequence rather than, oh, I liked this character. So if you do that, I will reach through the screen and punch you in the fucking balls. If you don't have balls, I will reach through the screen, attach some balls to you, and punch you there. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that's about all. Let, let me know your thoughts. Uh, it was lovely seeing you again. Well, I, I'm not seeing you, but you're seeing me. And that was all. Goodbye. Hello. Thanks to everyone who watched, especially if you watched all the way to this point. These names here, these are my patrons. If you go over to Patreon, then you can, you know, get your name put on here. Special thanks to all of my $10 and up patrons who are Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayen, Brother Santodis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Flax, Jalal Dalul, James M., Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Micaphone, Mistboy, Mitzi Mona, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Psych XS, Celine, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Toa Mikkel, Tesla Shark, Vevictix, Vimek Zol, and Wesley. All of you are great. All of the other people here, you're all great. If you want to get stuff like early access to my videos, then consider donating. If you don't feel like doing that, then, you know, become a channel member or just like this video, comment, and subscribe. You know, whatever. That's, that all works for me. Uh, you're all great. Have a lovely day. Goodbye.